It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My next guest is George Saunders. You know, you meet a lot of amazing people in my job. Some of them sort of stand above. George Saunders has been on our show a few times now. He's one of those people. Somebody I genuinely admire, personally as well as in his work. He's a writer. His short stories have appeared in The New Yorker, in GQ, McSweeney's, everywhere else. His 2013 book, a short story collection called The Tenth of December, was a finalist for the National Book Award. He also won a MacArthur Genius Grant. His latest is called Lincoln in the Bardo. It's his first novel ever. Like a lot of his work, it's pretty funny. But where his other stories often focused on the absurdity of consumerism, Lincoln in the Bardo goes back to the 19th century. It's almost historical fiction. Central to the book is the true story of Willie Lincoln, Abraham's son. He died when he was just 11 years old. The night he was buried, Lincoln returned to his son's crypt and held his lifeless body. Saunders' book takes place in the world between that death and the next life. It's like an oral history of voices from beyond the grave, voices that Willie Lincoln encounters on his journey to the afterlife. It's a moving, strange, tragic story. George Saunders, here with me now. Welcome back to Bullseye. Always great to have you here. Good to be back, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Um, this is like a real weird question to start an interview with, but it was the honest one that I was thinking about when I was reading uh, your new book. Are you afraid of death? Hell yeah. Yeah, I am. You? Oh, super afraid of death. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny? No, I'm, somebody said, no, I'm not. Not really. No, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I know people who aren't afraid of death. They say. Mm, my wife is not afraid of death. And my wife well, is a real straight shooter. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think if your understanding is correct, you probably wouldn't be as scared. But but if you're like me and you're kind of you know fond of yourself and <laughs> then you know then I, and a control freak, I think it would be. I had I had I think we talked about it last time, but I had a near plane wreck back in 2000 that kind of disabused me of any idea that I was you know okay with that. I don't think we did talk about that. What what happened? Well, it was just there was what it turns out was that there was uh, some geese flew into the engine of this flight as we were leaving Chicago, and it took the one engine out. So the symptom of that was that it the, it was just like somebody drove a minivan into the side of the thing, and then black smoke started coming out of those overhead air things, and people were screaming. And and I, you know, I'm from Chicago, so I kind of know the grid, and we were getting really, we were dropping really fast, and and. As far as I could tell, O'Hare was behind us and we were going down. And uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, I thought, you know, like I always imagine I'd be the guy who would stand up and say, everybody, let's join in a moment of gratitude. We've had beautiful lives here and let's sing Kumbaya. But that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't what was happening. You know, and I joke about it now, but it really was just like a, uh, the internal monologue was just like, no, 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 no. And kind of like negotiating. Let me let me, you know, turn time back and get out of the plane. And then also this sense like... Uh, geez, you know, I, I actually have to get out of this body now, of, of which I'm so fond. And uh, and then it's that seat right in front of me that's going to do the job, you know, that kind of thing. It's really hard to deal with stuff like that that you do not have control over and that there is not an answer to. Well, it makes you realize, I mean, it made me realize how much I'm on autopilot a lot of the time, just kind of like assuming you know, continued good health, continued mental stability, continued success. You know, you. in other words, I'm a pretty nice guy if all those things are in place. But, <laughs> you know, you take one away and suddenly you're whining, whining screaming baby. <laughs> it's like that um, engineering thing, which is uh, fast, cheap, good, pick two. Yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you can't have it all. As soon no, as something's no. wrong, the thing that's going to fall away is <laughs> happy niceness. Is it something that you think about? Yeah, I do. I mean, I do. I I think it's healthy. You know, I think that it's actually it's a it can be um, a spur to not be lazy. You know, not be slothful. Uh, and you know, in other words, if you do if you do build up a uh, an addiction to all those easy comforts, which I think we all do, just you know, it's kind of, I guess it would be productive to every so often just become aware of those those cheats that you've built into your life and, uh, you know, to kind of turn your mind towards death is a good way to do it. I, I mean, that's, this book was a four-year thing where every day you were in there kind of, I mean, in some ways you were just being a craftsperson and making good scenes and all that. But underneath it all, that was really the what, what was going on was a chance every day to kind of go, oh, yeah, death. I remember that. 
It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My guest is George Saunders. His debut novel, Lincoln in the Bardo, is out now. Yeah, I mean, I feel like my tool to escape existential dread has been, since I've been an adult, that I have to make a show every week. Yeah. Right? Like, it's inescapable. It's either I make a show that week or, you know, there's dead air, right? Yeah. And Well, I mean, that's something... Yeah. No, sorry. Oh, what I was going to say is, like, I feel like when I consider death, it has the opposite reaction. It encourages slothfulness because it makes me wonder why I've dedicated so much of my life to making a show every week and whether that's even a, a useful goal. Well, right. And that, and I know just what you're talking about, because for me, the when I was younger, the, uh, you know, making books was somehow, I mean, it wasn't that I thought it would um, spare me from death or illness, but it somehow, it kind of did feel that way. It felt like, all right, I, yes, death is coming, but in the meantime, I'm going to do this thing. And somehow embedded in that was the idea that if I did it well enough, I would get a pass, you know, or maybe if I did it well enough, I would be so happy and content that it would be easier to die or something like that. And of course, the pisser is you get to this stage of life where, you know, I've written a number of books, had a lot of success, probably more than I deserve. And the horizon is just getting closer. You know, it's not, it doesn't, it's actually not a, a way of getting out of that. But on the other side of that, I've had times where I've been kind of like, well, why am I writing books? I mean, I just won't. And then I just get depressed, you know, and if you get depressed, it really sucks. And you don't, and you become, uh, not powerful and you become mopey and you become a pain to be around. So in a sense, it's like if you were taking this medicine every day of doing art and it actually made you a better person and easier to get along with, it would be kind of irresponsible to not take it. That, that's kind of where I am right now. Or, you know, to say it in a more positive way, you, you got this thing that you love to do that actually demonstrably increases your engagement, increases your energy. So you'd be kind of, kind of dumb not to do it, I guess. It's funny, I'm, I'm in a stage of life where I think two things are true, and they, they might seem to contradict, but one is that, you know, at some level, nothing permanently matters. I mean, you, you know, you do good work, and it has a, sort of a nice ripple effect, and it makes people happy. And that, But all that, in, you know, including the people that you made happy through your work, they go away. So none of this stuff is... is um, carved in stone. And certainly if you if you position yourself as I did when I was young to think if I can only be really a great writer, then I'll endure. That's kind of that I don't think that's true actually. So that's one side of it. The other side of it, it's really kind of uh it feels to me really wonderful to make energy in the world. It, like just as a thing in itself, you know, to um to do something well is pleasurable. So that maybe even those temporary little energy waves that you make are actually really wonderful. They're really important. And they, that might be all we have. I mean, you go into a party and you're either fun and you cheer people up or you're a drag and you bring people down. The former is better somehow. Even even if everybody in the party, you know, is dead a week later, <laughs> so somehow the, the positive energy is actually a tangible thing. There are less jokes in this book. Yes. There are jokes in this book. There's a fair amount of pooping, for example, but um, less jokes. And I think for a lot of people who have a facility with jokes, jokes are the first place they go when things get tough. Yes. Is that sure. your personal inclination? Yes. Yeah. If there's, I mean, if there's any self doubt, then the jokes come in. Or, or sometimes I'll just get really stiff and formal <laughs> and and then being in that mode for a while i i can't stand it and i go into a joke so yeah no definitely was it hard not to do that um yeah it, i mean it it was until you the first time you did it and it f up the book you know like you get you're getting an emotional uh emotional scene going with in this graveyard and something actually you know for me new is happening in terms of the emotional intensity and then you get a little insecure and you drop in a joke and it, it kind of it just feels like a betrayal of the material so you, you know what i, I came to think about was because I, I definitely was conflicted over that and I, I had the worry that you would have which is am i going to alienate people who like my other stuff is this going to be some kind of one of those you know mid to late life earnestness things where whatever was wonderful in the early work goes away you were basically worried that you were going to make billy crystal's one-man show no, I, I didn't. I haven't seen that. But I mean, you know, there, there's this long, you know, in, in any artist you love, there's a place where they get too much on top of their material, maybe. 
And, and I think it's a it's a kind of a valid thing. I mean, you get to this point in life, and suddenly you realize that your artistic years are not infinite, and that you know all the great masters who are, who have worked over the centuries. That when you're 19, you'll just assume you'll overtake. You realize you're not even in the same hallway yet. So there's a certain urgency, and, and if you're like me, and if your early work is comic, you know, and fart infested, you you <laughs> might think, hmm, I better you know I better take on the big questions. So, but here's the thing that that was interesting to me. I remember thinking about this, like, okay, how do I get more humor into this book? And the answer I came up with is maybe you redefine what humor is, or you, you come to a different understanding of humor. Humor is not actually jokes. Jokes are one department of humor. But I came to think that humor is actually a subcategory of what we'll call wit. And what I mean by that is you're, you're writing a scene and you're on page 42. All right, so wit... Fictive wit, I think, actually means that when I'm on page 42 writing that and you're on page 42 reading it, part of my job is to precisely be able to imagine where you are. Like, what are the boxes that are open in your mind? What are you expecting? What are you dreading? Down to the micron level. So what that means is we're basically in a motorcycle in a very tight sidecar. So wit means I remember what I've already told you. I remember what the characters look like. I remember where they're standing. I remember when the last time they spoke, all that kind of stuff. Then when I just go a little bit to the right and you lean with me, that's the ultimate fictive moment. Now that's, you can see that in in a form of a joke for sure. You, you put a duck in the room and two pages later, the duck makes a noise at a, a funny moment. Part of the pleasure of that is that I remembered the duck and you remember the duck too. So with this book, I came to see that although humor wasn't always going to be appropriate or useful in an emotional sense wit always is hmm. you know what i mean so so all the time i thought i was being i was a good writer because i was good at jokes actually i'm telling myself you were a good writer because you were witty enough to remember the fictive situation and cash in with a joke so maybe in this, the analogy might be an actor who's done nothing but comic roles can that actor do a serious role of course because what he was doing in the comic role was being 100% in that cinematic moment and exploiting. So same thing. If it's a serious role, you got to be 100% in the moment and then exploit. Something like that. That's interesting. Like I feel like there is one of the essential qualities of jokes is they are immediately recognizable and that they solve some kind of puzzle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a language puzzle, sometimes a situational or a feelings puzzle. But they're also surprising in some way. They're also not the answer to the puzzle that you expected but there's yeah. still you know there's still a really good answer to the puzzle right and what you're describing in part is that that at least what i hear you describing is is that that kind of structure is not unlike the basic structure of fiction which is recognizing what the world is like and giving us something that solves our actual feelings and relationships in the world something recognizable but in a way that is not the not just a literal representation. Yeah. Although I might even I might even posit a slightly more technical explanation, which is when the reader is reading, she has her eyes on you, the writer, to see if you're taking her seriously or not. One of the ways she comes to understand that you don't is if, for example, in the middle of a scene, you change the setting without telling her because you forgot. It started out in a church and suddenly you're in a saloon. She goes, wait a minute, you don't you don't care about me at all because you're not paying attention to your own text. So one of the ways that you convey uh, intimacy and respect for the reader is to be acutely in mind of what you've told her already. This, now in, in terms of problem solving, I think what happens is you, you introduce some conceit or some convention into your story. Then, okay, you get to use that, but you have the responsibility of remembering that you introduced it and you have to honor it through the whole book. And I think you have to not only honor it, but you have to escalate it. So, for example, in, here, in this book, there's a scene early on where um, Lincoln is in the crypt with his son's body and his son's spirit is kind of flitting around really frustrated because the father is, not, is looking at the body instead of him. I was writing that and, you know, you do a lot of revision and you try to see what potential you might the scene might have. And at one point, the kid, the spirit, leans into Lincoln. And, you know, drawing on many, many years of, of ghosts in movies, well, when a ghost leans on a body, it goes in. And then there was just this kind of intuitive idea that, that actually I drew from earlier stories of mine, but the idea was that when a ghost goes into a person, it, the ghost can read the person's mind. All right, so 
that was kind of cool to discover that. And and you have this nice moment where the, the little boy actually is his dad for a couple seconds and understands the pain he's in and all that. Okay, so you do that and you're happy because it was a nice surprise that happened at speed. Well, okay, but then that means for the rest of the book, this quality we're talking about is wit, means that you have to remember that the ghost has that potential. And in a funny way, if the ghost, if some ghost or ghost doesn't escalate that potential, the reader's going to feel like you're not seeing her properly. You know, does this make sense? No. No, not at all. Not at all. It totally yeah. does, George. Yeah. So, so in other words, that means you, you know, you're trying to mine a fictive moment as much as you can. And then when you do that, you set up a convention that you have to honor. And I think that's what, for me, took the place of straightforward humor or jokes was the feeling that somehow the reader wouldn't bail on me if I continued to be that attentive to her. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. I'm here with George Saunders, the writer. His latest book is Lincoln in the Bardo. It's available now. The characters who are in the world that Willie Lincoln is in, this world that is a kind of after death, before afterlife world with somewhat undefined rules and boundaries, at least to them, they are all there apparently because of some unresolved thing in their life. Like one character, for example, was married to a much younger woman and had kind of agreed to have a let's just be friends relationship until they eventually found themselves falling in love, wanting to be physically intimate, and then he died before that happened. Wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> there are these really powerful desires and interests in their lives that were left unresolved when they died. And I wonder if writing this book made you think about desires that you had. Yeah. Well, you know, d desires and I think also uh, habits of clinging, you know, like for me, I, I have had so much good fortune that I don't have, a, I mean, desires, I, I don't, I kind of burn through a lot of stuff that I really wanted young and I, and, but what I have not come to grips with is just, but, you know, like for example, the fondness that I have for my wife and my kids, if anything kept me, you know, undead, it would be that. It would just be that I'm not done with that yet. I'm not ever going to be done with that. And then I suppose just, you know, just kind of that basic on a, on a lower level, just that basic fondness for self, you know, the idea that the world never existed until 1958 when I did. And, and uh, you know, I, I like that guy so much, <laughs> even though I kind of don't like him that much also. But in the book, mostly they're sort of dramatized examples of people who have regrets and who aren't quite done with this life. But I think all of us are in that mode, you know, that you've got, if nothing else, you've got a strong habit of thought, you know, like I'm pretty sure I'm going to fly home tomorrow from New York. And if I die right now, part of my mind is like, hey, I'm going to miss my flight, you know. <laughs> so, so, and also, you know, on another level, there's a lot of, I still have a lot of ambition energy and a lot of desire to keep writing. And so I think all those things would come into play. Although, to be honest, on the day when that plane thing was going on, I didn't even get to that place at all of, I don't think I even got to the place of going, I don't want to die. It was just an incredibly strong visceral I don't know if it was terror, but it was like denial. That's all I, I mean, it, the thing went on for probably 10, 15 minutes. It seemed like an hour, but I never even got to the place where I'm like, oh my God, I won't see my wife again. It, it didn't even, it was almost like you were so, um, there was so much adrenaline that your mind stopped working. It just, it wasn't working like a normal mind anymore. It's very sort of like animal energy. I don't want to finish this up without talking for a minute about the president because you wrote a really... Uh, amazing piece about essentially going on the campaign trail or going to some presidential rallies for the New Yorker when the campaign was still on. Did you vote for the president? I voted for a president. <laughs> <laughs> no, I voted for Hillary, 100%. So I imagine that your feelings about that were pretty fixed when you headed out on to these rallies. For sure, yeah. What did you expect to find it, and and how is it different? Yeah, I mean, well, on those stories, what I tend to do is is just try to know what my opinion is before we, I go, and then say, okay, so this is what I'm starting with. Dear world, please disabuse me of this notion if you can, or reinforce it if you can. So, in other words, you're kind of doing somewhere rhetorically in the piece, you're doing a full confession of what your ingoing prejudice is, and then as the story unfolds, you you adjust that prejudice. Or so. So my my thought was just basically, I mean, from the first time I heard. Trump speak, I didn't think he's sincere. I don't think he's, um, strangely, strange to say, I don't think he has an adequate experience of the world. 
He's been a rich celebrity for a long time, and I don't think he knows some really basic things <clears throat> about human beings that we know, that most people know, just from having been in the trenches. And that's okay, except it was also suffused with this kind of mean-spiritedness that I thought from the beginning was uh, role-playing. He, he had a certain demographic in mind, and he knew how to get to him. Uh, and that was signaled in that early birther stuff, you know. So I, I went on the trail definitely not liking it. But the thing I was interested in was what, how could it be that it was so clear to me and so many of my liberal friends that this guy was not even a, was a non-starter. And yet he was picking up momentum at that time in the polls. So I, I really wasn't that interested in him, but I was interested in the people who were supporting him. What was the sort of intellectual or rhetorical basis for them to be so crazy about him? What did you find? Well, it was so confusing, you know, there, I mean, it was, in the end, it was sort of like this big Willy Wonka machine and I would be up nights going, okay, so if, you know, or like an algebraic equation, if someone doesn't like Hillary and is not a racist and is concerned with re regulations and we turn the crank, we'll get a Trump supporter, you know, and there's a million variants of that. So I think at this point, what I think is essentially we're looking at a moment where we're reaping the, the cost of about 30 years of, of income income uh, inequality, where the rich have gotten so much richer just on autopilot and the middle and the poor people have gotten hit harder and harder. That, okay, plus the rise of the right-wing media that I think in future years will be shocking when, when you see how quickly they came into play and how uh, cynically. Those two things combine, I think, to, to produce this phenomenon. It's not the case that everybody who voted for Trump was some variant of the Joad family, poor and working class. That's not the case. So Bernie Sanders had his, his finger on both those issues. So I think now, we're, now what we're seeing is there was a real sickness or maybe a, a sort of a two-headed sickness of the rise of a kind of right-wing sensibility and this income inequality. And there was a, the country had a big spasm and they turned to the wrong doctor, basically. Do you feel hopeful about any part of it? I feel help, hopeful about young people. <clears throat> you know, I teach at Syracuse and uh, also when I was on the story, I went to some Bernie Sanders rallies. And I think the, I actually think objectively that young people are less full of it than people my age. They, they were raised in the least, generally, you know, in a less racist environment and a less homophobic environment. And, you know, I don't know how much of this is just getting older, but I look at myself in, in the 70s, you know, when I was in high school and the kind of ambient, snarky, suspicious, fearful stance that, that so many of us had. I don't pick up on that in my students. They, they are much more um, present and straightforward. Now, of course, there's a lot of distortion possible in that, but that's how it seems to me. So I, I am hopeful. I think what we're in right now is just a big, very regrettable step backwards into a, a vision of America that was never true. It was never hopeful. It's sort of this strange, in the piece I call it racial nostalgia, for a time that actually never existed. That, that America that was great before, that it was always complicated and it was not great for a lot of people. But I'm hopeful that, I, that this is a hiccup and that this generation will pass, including me, and the people who are uh, younger now will, will just sort of look at our and go, why did they think that? Why were they so unkind to each other? And maybe they'll, uh, they'll move past it. But generally, I think like being optimistic or pessimistic or hopeful or not hopeful, are, they're kind of manifestations of the same disease, which is our desire to go on autopilot. I mean, just dispositionally, I like to sound optimistic and I like to sound hopeful, mainly because then you don't have to think about it. You're just always Marlo Thomas and that girl throwing your hat, or maybe that was Mary Tyler Moore throwing her hat in the air. But you know, you're always the happy person who knows what to think of everything. And similarly with pessimism, if you can just get on a stance that says life and it's getting worse, that's very comfortable because you don't have to budge. But the more difficult position, I think, is to say that both optimism and pessimism are called for, and we just don't know. And unfortunately, till the day we die, we're going to have to continue to maintain that ambiguous posture that is so uncomfortable for human beings. George, thank you so much for coming on Bullseye again. You're always welcome. I really appreciate it. It's always fun, man. Thank you so much. I was looking forward to it for a long time. George Saunders, Lincoln in the Bardo, is available now. Find it wherever you buy books. And I'm just going to be real with you. George Saunders is legit my hero in the world. If you haven't read any of his works, get with it, man. That guy's the best.